Black, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. I, I'm wearing my Fadley shirt for those of you watching out on the internet. We're going to be bringing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour back down to Fadley's for a big fat crab cake, a little mustard, and some delicious mac and cheese down at Lexington Market. They're coming to Catonsville as well. Uh, and a reminder, the Maryland Lottery is presenting the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. It starts at Mama's on the half shell down in Canton. We're going to be on the square doing a proper eating scunny crab cake and uh, probably having a beverage or two before it's all over with. Don, I've asked you to pick this program up and invite some first timers on. And that's challenging because we're like almost you know, going into our fourth year of doing this. Right. So we've had all sorts of people, politicians, pundits, friends, enemies on the program. And so it is when I ask you, dig me out some new awesome guests. This you, you, you've reached the top on this one. This one's going to be a good one. Oh, this is a good one. Legendary Baltimore Sun reporter, uh, 20 years, uh, went on to, uh, I think, and we'll talk about it, I think do some work with, with the Maryland Matters when it was a, a fledgling little startup. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. And then, of course, on to much fame at, at HBO with The Wire and Show Me a Hero and the upcoming We Own This city so it's it's a pleasure to welcome in bill zorsey bill welcome to baltimore positive thanks thank thank you don i appreciate that thanks bill I, I had to laugh one of the descriptions in reading some stuff getting ready for you they said bill was tough and cranky did you, did you like did you like the, you buy into the description of tough and cranky I think most everybody would buy into that description of tough and cranky. <laughs> Bill, I, is that I something you cranky. owned over the years? Bill, I look like a softy, man, but like every reporter and editor I ever loved in our building down on Calvert Street was a curmudgeon. I mean, Phil Jackman was my mentor, right? So like curmudgeon and Jackman were there. There, There is something about being a writer and being critical and being critical thinking leads some people to think you're being too negative. <laughs> Hey, Bill, Nestor told, <laughs> Nestor told our friend Fraser Smith, who was on a number of times, that he was afraid of Fraser. I was afraid of Fraser. I, I, was, I was afraid, afraid of you. Of I, yeah, I never came up. Serious cats? <laughs> I mean, like, Simon and Raphael would be coming by me at, like, 2 in the morning up on the fifth floor, and I would get them Chinese food from Young sometimes. But I tried to stay out of the reporter's way. The only reporter that ever loved me, Dick Irwin. Dick would come over and put his feet up and start telling – the cop tales of what happened tonight or whatever, but all you cats were really, really serious investigating murders. And I was 17 years old running around the newsroom, man. I just needed to stay out of the way. And some of you saw some gruesome stuff that made you a curmudgeon. I think, I think that might be it. I think it's just sort of being exposed to, you know, what life is out there in the world and, and seeing it up close and being, you know, being witness to a lot of it. I think that sort of, adds to the curmudgeonliness of well, but that's We're also gonna... added your creativity though right i mean that's part of experiencing that in a way that maybe i'm too timid to go to the crime scene that you've been there a million times and that allows you to make the kind of uh, productions that you've made in your life right well i you know i i, I went to a, a number of crime scenes but i wasn't really a crime reporter per se you know i mean i i did cover cops mostly in Howard County when it wasn't really, uh, you know, quite what it is today. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of saw life up, uh, up close a little more terrifyingly by, by being a political reporter, you know? So I was exposed to a whole, a whole different, you know, scene of, of, uh, of carnage there. Yeah. yeah. We're going to get into all of the, the politics stuff before we do though, Bill, you and I chatted, briefly this morning as we came on the air Nestor and I've been talking about it it's almost unimaginable the images that we're seeing in the discussion as Russia invades a sovereign country and the Ukrainian people are at risk and as a longtime political observer and someone who I was I'm sure was up late last night trying to make sense of this what's what's your immediate reaction as someone who's covered government for a long time of what we're seeing I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, we joked, you know, earlier or a minute ago, I, that was a joke, by the way, <clears throat> that's just sort of the extent of my humor, but um, <laughs> um, it just is, it's shocking to me. It, it truly was shocking to me. And I, and I, I couldn't take my eyes off of it last night, even though it was, 
you know, as TV is want want to be a little difficult to watch <clears throat> at times. But um, I, 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 it's just you know, I it made me think of uh, I guess coming up as a kid, I always wondered how Hitler managed to do what he did in the '30s. And I even, you know, I, I have this thing that's stuck in my, my mind, this, this image in my mind many years later of when Russia uh, came in to, to, to squash the uh, Hungarian revolution and, you know, throw, people throwing rocks at tanks. That, that, so all these things are sort of in the back of my mind as I'm watching this play out in real time. And it was, uh, it sort of really struck a, a, a uh, sort of a, a, a very somber tone in my, my mind as, as I sort of approach this, what I thought would be sort of a sort of a gas today, you know, but I, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a, a, a cloud hanging over. Oh, it's heavy. I mean, we felt it from the time I woke up this morning, I don't know how we could talk about anything else. You know, there's something I sit around here talking about the Orioles and baseball lockouts and who the Ravens are. And I'm like, this is, this is horrific. And to your point on the political side, this is what happens when politics goes wrong, right? When you get it wrong. I mean, we have a former president praising this right now, like literally a guy that 75 million people are, are, on that side of the cult and say, this is good. And whatever he says is good. And he seems to like Putin and Putin seems to be a nice man. Uh, I, I th that there is a faction in our country that just would have been unspeakable in 1985 here that we would have felt that way about anything Soviet. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, it, it, th that is shocking actually that part, but I mean, I, I also wonder about things like, uh, you know, I guess just looking back over history, I've, I've wondered my, myself, like, how did Huey Long get to be where he got? And how did, you know, Father Coughlin get to be where right. he got? And, you know, I, I think we see now through those, where the 75 million people have, have led us, I, I think we, I think we see how, you know, in real, in real time, as they like to say, uh, yeah, that, how we that got That element, there. Bill, I, I couldn't agree more. That element has always been there. And I'm one, actually, we talked with your <clears throat> former colleague, Peter Jensen, recently. And I, I said to Peter, I'm one of the folks who subscribe to the belief that had there been a Fox News during Watergate, Richard Nixon would have served two full terms. I, I believe that with a Steve Bannon <clears throat> and a Fox News, it would have been very, I mean, Perhaps Barry Goldwater and Howard Baker and others would have stepped up. I'm not so sure. Right. I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, it I speaks to the power to what you've done, you know, in the course of your life and, and report on this, right? And reporting on what politicians are really after, where they're getting their money, all of these these issues. But I, I, I think all this through now on – the, the information and the questions we've had to ask all of our lives start to matter when world wars start to happen again, right? And or, or when we say, are we going to participate or are we not going to participate? And what, san what do sanctions mean against tyranny, against evil? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I don't know if. I have anything to do with that, you know, or I can, you know, I don't, I, I no, but being in the news media and controlling minds, I'm talking about, you know, I, reporting I, don't, facts. I don't think of myself as controlling minds, but okay. Well, uh, disseminating information so people can make up their own mind. Right. That's I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's me, an but... issue of Fo well, Fox news because yeah, it says but... news on it. People think it's truth. Well, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> well, Bill, these are the issues we talk about here. <laughs> well, looking back at your career and your, before we get into all of the HBO projects and your 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 passion project, which was, um, you know, show me a hero. When you look back at your 20, I look when you were there from the 70s to the 90s, there were some real characters in state government that you were covering. And I mean, you were one of the most respected government reporters at that time. What, who were some of the folks that when you write your memoir, there'll be a <laughs> chapter on that you'll say, boy, cover, is it William Donald Schaefer? Is it, who, who is it? That, is it Marvin Mandel? Who, who sticks out for you? Well, all those guys stick out. I mean, but I, but I, you know, how do you, how do you ignore Schaefer? Really? I mean, I'm sure you knew him. Um, 
he he was an absolute character, you know, and you never knew what you were going to get, although you usually had a pretty good idea. Um, so I, I, I sort of, you know, covered him as, I didn't sort of cover him, I actually did cover him uh, as governor. So, um, you know, I, Marvin was his own guy. I didn't really cover him until after the fall. Um, you know. I, well, I know. To Schaefer, I mean, well, Schaefer was unhappy by the time he got to the state house, right? Like he was a different kind of politician as a governor than he was as a mayor, as I as it's been told to me by people like Fraser. I, I don't know. I, I I don't know that. I'd have to think about that for a minute. Like I don't I, I don't know. I don't know that he was happier as as I guess he was happier as mayor. Maybe that's is that what maybe that's what Fraser meant. Well, I think he really built something. I mean, I lived that this this shot was taken from where I lived the last 19 years at Harbor Court. And I mean, I saw another business went out at Harbor Place. But every time I ever walked through the Inner Harbor, I mean, there's a real connection to him in every single way in the city. I don't know that the state by the time he got to the state and the memoirs and the things that I've read. But during that period of time, what he had built in Baltimore was just it, we're still sort of eating off it today, 40 years later. That's true. That is true. No, I, I mean, I think Maryland, but you know, I mean, it's, it's a big state for the, the, the America and miniature that it is, you know, it is, it is difficult to leave that kind of a uh, mark on the whole of, of a state as opposed to as the whole of a city. So I guess I, 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 I see that point. Yeah. What are there? Are there? Well, well, let's put it, let's go back to this way. Then you talk about Schaefer. I'm always fascinated. And we did talk to Frazier a lot about uh, uh, William Donald Schaefer. What, what was his magic sauce, Bill? What, what made William Donald Schaefer an effective leader? Because one of the things we like to talk about on here is leadership. What made him effective? And you covered him a long time. Hmm. <laughs> I don't think I saw that one coming. Um, I don't know. I guess it was his his quirkiness and and the and the fact that he did actually care about things and uh, uh, care about doing things right. And um, um, were you ever on the receiving side of any of his tirades as a reporter? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, Frequently, I, I think, at, or at times I, I was, you know, and he would just walk by and, or you, you I, I mean, there, there is one, one sort of, I think this is probably as close as I'll get to a memoir. I had written some, a piece about returning to cover Annapolis for Maryland Matters. And it was, you know, 30, 30 years after the fact when I had first gone there. And um, I included a, a piece in a conversation that I happened to have that never made the newspaper, but I, I, I held on to the quote, and it was uh, a quote about Schaefer yelling at me um, and saying, you know, I don't know what you're trying to do, what the hell you're trying to do to me if you're trying to have me indicted or have me. It just went on and on and on. I, I was like dumb, dumb. I, I was comic, really. So I sort of, and I understood that uh, sort of reaction to things because it it is off putting and it it's a it's sort of a conversational trick you know if you will so maybe that's a power you know uh, uh, indicative of his his ability to manipulate power i don't know but no during that period of time in newspapers i mean and i was in the same newsroom as you and we were colleagues without knowing it but like uh, my dad was pissed at me in 1992 and he died that year for leaving the paper you know i took a buyout in early 92 i was 23 years old i wasn't of the mindset that there will never be a newspaper there right i was always of the mindset of yeah there'll be a newspaper here the rest of my life my dad wanted me to get a gold watch wanted me to be oscar madison and take stedman's job and like all that stuff and i left and i i got pushed out of newspapers very early on and have watched you know over three decades the sort of deterioration of the business side of it you were there a little longer and a little later and Felt it, but did you feel like when you were early in your career, you would have been a newspaper guy your whole career? That when you're Googled now, television pops up, right? And and that side of it, but 
I think for many people, for, for me, as a, I thought it was a job for life. I, I really did want to do that work forever, thinking there would always be a hard newspaper, that my mind at 20 is a lot different than at 50 about all of that. And clearly, the banner's coming. The sun is what it is at this point. But you probably wanted to be a newspaper reporter your whole life, if, if it existed as a, a vocation. I guess. I don't, I don't know that I ever thought about that. You know what I mean? I don't think I, I ever really planned on... I haven't really planned on very much in my life, to be honest with you. But um, that's why I turned out so good. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know about that. But the, uh, I, you know, I never thought about the gold watch. Yeah, you know, I, I, I did always think about being a newspaper reporter. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a, my father was a newspaper reporter, but also before me, but then got out of the the game because and went into PR because he had to pay for us to all go to school and put clothes on our back and things like that. But. Um, so, Bill, you step away from the sun to pursue this, as I've read it, passion project of show me a hero. And I was fascinated by that when it came out because it. Oh, wow. You were you were one of the 70 people who watched it. Oh, I love <laughs> I, I Well, let me I will start with my spoiler alert. If our listeners now go back and watch it, Oscar Isaac is amazing as Mayor Nick Wasico. I, I guess that's how I pronounce it, Wasico. Wasisco. Wasisco. Um, <clears throat> you know, in Yonkers, Westchester County, New York, an issue that is as prevalent today as it was back then in terms of affordable housing. And at the time, um, uh, another senior advisor to Kevin Kamenitz, and I was Kevin's chief of staff, <laughs> said to Kevin at the time, hey, because he loved policy and policy debates, and affordable housing was always an issue in Baltimore County. So we said, hey, you've got to watch this series on HBO, Show Me a Hero. It is terrific. He said, oh, I haven't started yet. I haven't started yet. I said, but I will. So no, no, you've got to watch it. So <laughs> about a week two weeks later he comes in and kevin Love and i are staying there and he throws kevin cameron throws his hands up and he goes he commits suicide <laughs> the mayor commits suicide why did you think i was going to be inspired by a mayor and we just burn I, I i can never think of that show without thinking about that but bill talk about that project how it came to your attention, why you were so passionate, and finally able to get it on the air after evidently many fits and starts. Well, I don't, I don't know that it was really ever my my passion per se. I, I'm not sure. You know, I don't know about that. But um, you know, David Simon, my uh, you know, my I guess occasional writer writing partner, and I I knew him. You know, I guess I first met him, and we had many good adventures together professional and otherwise at the, at the paper, um, came to me and uh, uh, said, you got to come. By that point, he had left the, the sun and he was, uh, he had done his bit with Homicide, um, the TV show for NBC. And they were working on, at that point, they were working on the, the beginning of The Wire, the first season of The Wire. And uh, he just said to me, you need to do this. You need to come eat from my deli tray, as the expression goes, and um, uh, you know, read read this book, and you'll love it. Blah blah blah. It was based on a book by Lisa Belkin, uh, formerly of the New York Times. And um, I, actually, he called on on deadline, uh, as he might, and um, as I have come to expect. And I, I, you know, frankly, I forgot about it. I mean, I just said, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Cause you know, I had copy to move for the, for, you know, through the desk and cause I, by that point I had stopped reporting and I had become an editor. I'm embarrassed to say, but. Eat better um, Chinese food. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, were you on the Calvert street at that point or down in the new tank? Oh, I, I I've never been, I, I left in 2000. Okay. So it was Calvert two, street. 2002. Right. So it was. Calvert oh, street. sure. Okay. Sure. So, um, he called me back like, I don't know, six weeks later or something and said on deadline again, you know, I'm like, yeah. And he said, so did you read the book? I'm like, what book? 
like I said, do you read the book? Show me a hero. I'm like, you know, I've been meaning to read that book, but I haven't read it. He goes, well, you need to read the book because we've got a meeting scheduled. It was, you know, in a month. So I read the book. I, I you know, I did sort of fall in love with the, with the story. Um, maybe it's the tragedy of the story that I, you know, cause I'm sort of drawn to things like that. Um, and that's how I got involved in it. I, you know, a couple of months later, I made the announcement or, you know, I, I told him I was leaving the sun. I asked him for a buyout, Nestor. I think we talked about this uh -huh. and uh, they wouldn't give me a buyout that they were, they were offering them. They, they were not, uh, you know, it was discretionary, I guess. So they, well, uh, what about the tragedy that, that, that you like, I don't want to play uh, Dr. Melfi here on you, but uh, uh, what about that? makes the hook for you that says i want to be a part of this when you read a book well first of all it was i mean it was unusual in that um i mean the whole thing is a tragedy really but you know it's 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 one that's not just peculiar to, to yonkers but um um i don't know i'm just drawn to the darkness of of things like that so well, they you certainly know, make that, television, right? I mean, television has to, that, 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 that works for TV. Well, I don't know. I, I'm not a TV guy, believe it or not. You know, I, I still don't think of myself as a TV guy. So it's, to me, it's, it's compelling because it, it, it is what life is for, you know, life and death is, I mean, how much more compelling do you get? Can you get than that? So I, I don't know. So that's what we're it, talking about a mayor, Bill, for folks who are not familiar with the story who it was part of a, a judicial ruling that Yonkers had to move forward. It, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to remember back when, when, I, when I saw the show. Had to move forward with affordable housing. And his approach was to really spread the units out all over Yonkers. It wasn't like creating a concentration of poverty. So it was really sort of Am I correct? 25 units here and 25 units there and well, still I, was incredibly controversial. I think the, you know, I don't want to get lost in the weeds, which is right. actually I, I would prefer to get lost in the weeds because that's what I do. But um, uh, the order came down from, from Judge Sand to build 200 units of public housing. So it wasn't even affordable housing. This is sort of it's the same principle in a sense. Right. Um, put it somewhere else other than downtown where all the high rises are. And that was, you know, that was sort of, that was the order. And he brought on a guy by the name of, uh, well, it doesn't matter. So, so they, they come up with a plan to spread it out and the judge buys into that and he orders all, all the, the 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 judicial order is actually just build 200 units of, of housing you know of, pub, of public housing the, um anyway that you know so that's the short version that's about as short as it can make it but um they come up with this plan to to build as you put as you say 20 units here 20 five units here, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the, the council was required to sign off on it. It was almost just a, well, they, they were required to sign off on it and they wouldn't sign off on it. And it's a, it, you know, it's a different form of government than we're used to around here. It was a, a what they call a weak, a weak mayor form of government. And, uh, well, you I, I, weren't you an administrator? Weren't you the county administrator for a while? Yes. Well, so, no, I was the chief of staff, so I'm very much involved in that issue. Okay, but you know, it, the, the county administrator really runs the county, you know, Correct. or or ran the county in 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 Yonkers, even though there was a mayor, you know, on paper, and that was Nick Wasisco, who was the mayor, and uh, he, it just turned into. Uh, I don't know how what I can say on the on a podcast, but it, it was a it was a it was a circus. It was a, it was an absolute circus that drew the national press, you know, national media attention. Um, 
you know, the judge threatened to, to send the four recal or three recalcitrant, I don't even know what it is now, three, three or four recalcitrant councilmen who wouldn't vote for it to jail. I mean, it was sort of a, a, a forerunner of, you know, the Donald Trump syndrome, but um, anyway. That, we mean not following the law. Correct. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, and then, then because and and you know becoming a victim, uh, and you know, as you know, as a result, I'm a victim. They're they're pillaring me for you know because I'm I'm just standing up for the rights of you know of whatever, making America great again. I I, I don't know. So the so Hank Spallone and these guys were uh, they just stood in the you know stood in the way and this went on for this dragged on so i mean that's kind of the short version it doesn't sound very compelling but um yeah, but it's it's <laughs> compelling and then of course the suicide which to this day i think right bill there's no clear i mean people only surmise from what i gather why the suicide whether it was he feared he was going to be indicted whether it was the pressure of trying to bring about this societal change. There's no real clear answer. Was there as to why the suicide? No, there, there isn't. I, I mean, it's a mis. He didn't leave a note and, uh, you know, there, there is even a, a uh, for a while there was, as there always seems to be a, a, an idea that, you know, he may have been murdered out there at the, at the cemetery. So, um, which is where he, kills himself right but, um, so before before show me a hero you and your writing pal mr simon get involved in a little show that took on a life of its own called the wire and i guess the quite and you won awards for the wire were nominated for certain episodes that you wrote you actually had a bit part in the wire you were, wait a minute a bit part I had i had you know I, I was in nine episodes. There you okay. go. Okay, a recurring role. That, a <laughs> that was a princi role. principal role. It was. It was. You know, a got me in the sc role Screen in the Actors wire. Guild. How no, much got a card. The, nice. How much of the Wire bill came from your work at the Sun and what you were covering? Well, let me just back up a second. The um, Actually, I didn't get involved in the wire at that. I, I really made the jump to go write or work on, and I didn't know a thing about how to write a screenplay, but that's another story. Um, to go right into Show Me a Hero. Um, it was only as things evolved, although I was, I, I acted, I might add, you know, Nestor, just, you know, and I'll be, I'll be signing autographs later, but- You acted like uh, a reporter. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I, I did. I, I played a, a, a foul mouth cantankerous uh, reporter uh, named, uh, oddly enough, named Bill Zorzi. And um, who, who cast that? Your buddy, Simon? <laughs> I, I think he did. And uh, it's an inside job. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 in season one, but I, I didn't really start on staff until season three. So I, I was in three, four and five or wrote right. for three, four and five. Bill, now that but, I've had you here 30 minutes, I'm going to like be really honest with you and i ran into over? simon no no i no i ran into simon um six weeks ago right before christmas at, at an event and i know him enough that he knows who i am and i but we were in the same i know Raphael better through real life and you know 30 years later or whatever and david's going on to do his thing and i bump into him in places i've never watched the wire and i know how wonderful how i know how incredible as an art piece of art it is and how do you and, know and don well hold on don <laughs> well because i follow the internet and i live here and i'm from here oh, and, okay. and i everywhere i go it says baltimore on my card my hat my shirt the ravens logo whatever um and i know people love it and i love the sopranos so i i've seen every episode of the sopranos so i like i i like good drama i was never attracted to it and and maybe you Get this, maybe you don't. I lived literally here. I lived on the 23rd floor at Harbor Court since 2003, the last 20 years. I saw the city on fire when Freddie Gray happened. I saw the plumes of smoke, I, all, like all of that. Media and I, elitist. It, 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 <laughs> it, it just wasn't the image of it that people portray to me with Baltimore, with crime, that, you know, all the stuff that I see, that I talk about on my show, that I've in, embraced the conversation around how we make our city better, which a lot of people have run from. But I, I just don't want to see 
that and be in that right now i think it's a thing like hemingway books i'm going to read later in my life can you literally and I, i'm not trying to be trite <laughs> make a case for why i should should watch it because i want to i'm going to watch it i just didn't want to watch it in baltimore in my 40s when i lived there like i in the city i just i i, I don't want to see that side because i know how true some of it is <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's all pretty true. I mean, it's fictional, but it's it's all based on reality. It's and it's not just, you know, a drug investigation and and you know, it's not just the drug world. Like each season, I think of it this way, and I've said this before, each season the the universe expands by a circle. Like, you know, and I'm not talking about a circle of circle of hell, but you know, it so they, you know, they they look at the death of work in season two. And they look at the beginning of politics in season three. And they look at the school system in season four, and then they they look at the, the media in season five. So and that's what makes it so media is it appeals back an onion that you have to stay in. Uh, and and I know that. I'm gonna watch I'm gonna watch it front to back. I just from the people who made it. If I sit with David over a coffee one day, I would just ask him like, make a pitch for why this is essential for me to spend what 50, 60 hours of my life doing it that I know I need to do it because Don yells at me because I feel like there's a point of reference for Baltimore that everyone else has this whatever the opinion well, of of not just the art of what it is, but of Baltimore. You know, like it, it, that, that, we... that it was so good that people think it's real <laughs> we finally well, wore real. <laughs> we finally wore my brother and sister-in-law down because like you they were holdouts and i will tell you that two months ago because it takes a couple of months if you're going to watch all five um how many seasons. episodes is it 60 or uh, like that it is 60 okay yeah, well, so okay, it's, i was guessing okay fair it's enough. going to take you a while but i will tell you that my brother mike and my sister-in-law bridget have now will now say to me, I can't believe we never watched this. It's one of the greatest things we've ever seen. And Bill, I, congratulations on being part of something that's iconic. Twenty it's, years later, never, we're still talking never about a it. List, there's never a list of television series that it's not listed as. Well, one there's of the not best. a lot of things. Um, I don't want to say I'm ashamed, but embarrassed that I've never. <laughs> people get yeah. really so, pissed at me when I say I've never seen The Wire, and I'm so, like. I think you should be more more embarrassed that you haven't read any Hemingway. There you go. Oh, there's Amen, a farewell Bill. arms. Amen. Oh. Hey, Bill. Bill I, I agree. Back to the wire. Yeah. Did you have – I think it has some of the most compelling characters ever, from Stringer Bell to Corsetti to McNulty to Bunk. Was there a character that – I've heard writers say before, I loved that character. Was there a character that you really liked writing for? Well, I, I did most of the, the political line. So um, I, I have to admit, I, I liked writing Norm, the Norman Wilson character. Um, now tell folks they, who that is if they have, if they're not familiar. He has he sort of became the aide de camp and then a, I guess the chief of staff of sorts to Mayor Carcetti, um, Aiden Gillen, who was a good guy. And uh, he, he's named for a guy who worked at the Evening Sun, who, when the papers were merged, came over as as night editor um, on the Morning Sun. Uh, I don't know if you knew him. Nestor or not, but uh, he was there when you were there, uh, Norman Wilson. So that he, to me, as the foil to Carcetti, he was he he was fun to me to write. You know, um, I mean, there are other characters like uh, you know, even walk on characters like the old Italian mayor. Who could that be? Um, who gives his little speech to Carcetti and? At lunch that day, um, about like what it, what it's like being mayor. Right, right. And, and with Tom, I call that the Tommy D'Alessandro. It's exactly character. what it is. Uh, you had uh, obviously anybody watches that. Uh, no wonder you know, people think this is realistic because you started pegging, you know, Martin O'Malley and you know, real people and all. Was Governor Schaefer involved in it? Was, it? was there a Mayor Schaefer character in any way? There was not. 
There was not. I I, I don't believe. But I mean, there you were, couldn't I, write one like that. It's it's too unique. Nobody believe it. My friend, the governor. My friend, the governor. It, it's 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 not high on his must see TV list. He's I'm he's sure happy Bill I has, haven't watched it. I'm sure Bill has heard that before. Bill, there was also I thought a, a terrific character. I'll call the Larry Young character. Uh, <laughs> right? I uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, hey, go, it, go to go to. It 10, might be 000. the Clarence Mitchell the third character. I don't know. It's like some people okay. have guessed that as well, but I don't okay. know. Well, go to go before we talk about we own this city. Your latest project. Go to ten thousand feet. What's what is the Baltimore that is portrayed over? five seasons of the wire what is the baltimore and is it a universal story of the challenges of urban america i think so i mean i i think that's exactly right i think i think the universality of it is is the appeal of it i mean it's you know it's um, i'd like to think that it's compelling television from a drama a dramatic sense or in a dramatic sense but the, these are all problems that we face you know as a nation and you know as that universe gets smaller you know as as a as a resident of the city or whatever and you know we tried to make it i think as real as possible um i mean there are lots of stringer bells across the United States of America, right? There are Stringer Bells who are running these, I'll call them mini cartels for lack of a better word, all across America. Am I correct? Yeah, I think it's, I think to a, it is to a lesser degree now because I think everybody seems to be in the game. So, you know, the old uh, oligarchs, if you will, sort of, they've been replaced by, you know, a million corner boys you know um i mean there are obviously the feds will tell you this there there are big drug dealers and and suppliers out there in the world but the game as they call it um is is different on the street now um but, so, and, so and sometimes the cartel are the cops right well let's get <laughs> let's <laughs> That what a what a segue. We are I do this for time. a living professionally, Bill. I mean, you write transitions. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is all part of. Well, my there brain. you go. I'm gonna say what a what a transition. We're with longtime <laughs> Sun reporter Bill Zorsi, uh, famous by way of HBO. Uh, a little detour along the way to uh, the Maryland Matters, which most up most of us go to right away when we wake up every morning. Bill, we had Justin Fenton on back when the book came out. We own this city, and. Mm -hmm. I told everyone, I probably, I kid adjusted. I probably sold 50 copies in a week because everybody I talked to. I don't I know that I had a segment ever on the political side that for a month, everybody came up to me and said, oh, oh my God, I got to get the book. I can't believe, you know, like it was one of those things that it sort of sells itself. And again, it's true life carnage in Baltimore, right? Like literally that that's, that's what you're right. chronicling. And that's where oh, I yeah. start with Bill now. Bill, having covered the crime beat for 20 years in Baltimore uh, for the folks who don't know, we own this city is about Baltimore's gun trace task force police run amok. Um, was Justin's book surprising to you or did you go? <laughs> no kidding. No, it was, it was surprising to me. And, and I, I, you know, I, I, I know I'm not a great interview cause I, I think I've already warned you about that, but um uh, I find it pretty compelling. So yeah, I've enjoyed want... having you on, actually. <laughs> yeah. okay. I, I don't think you're a willing participant, but I think I can melfi you. At. That's where I get my gift is, is to get well, the I, best I, out I, of I, you, I, Bill. Well, nobody's no, nobody's making me walk this plank. I'll just say that other than <laughs> uh, other than Don. He, he sort of sweet talked me into questions it. about all of this. Right. <laughs> so, but but go back. You said you said you were I, I'm fascinated by that answer. And I want well, you to explain. You, well, you saw surprised. everything, right? You've seen everything. Well, yeah, I would like to think of it. I haven't seen, you know, who, who would have thunk that uh, Russia would be invading Ukraine, but that's another story. Um, 
when when I got wind of this, when I was approached about this, you know, I was like, Christ, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to write another, you know, dirty cop story. And I just, I just, you know, it's not that interesting to me. It's not that compelling. And, you know, I mean, that, that seemed, and I didn't know anything about it. And then I started, you know, it was sort of like, well, come on, take a look, blah, 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 blah. So I started reading, you know, the, the, the indictments, I started reading the, the search warrant affidavits, I started reading, you know, more and more about this, and it was shocking. I mean, it was shocking. Because it was so um, systemic, because so many people had to be in on it for it to work? Well, just that it worked at all, and went on for, you know, I mean, I guess it didn't go on for that long, it just seemed like it go, went on for that long, but but it, as it turned out, it, it is systemic. When you, when you look at how these guys came up and how they were trained, over time, you know, sort of what had happened to the the police department, um, or how it had, had changed just in you know, twenty years, and uh, for any number of reasons. And then the the other piece of this, which is not really so much in the, in Justin's book, but the other piece is that we sort of smushed together, which is a, a, a filmmaking term of art, I think, smushed. Um, is uh, the DOJ's investigation and in Department of Justice's investigation and assessment of the police department, and it's some of its constitutional failings. And uh, you talk about the consent decree. Absolutely, the consent decree. So we we there's a, a whole storyline built around that that kind of happens simultaneous with this GTTF investigation. So. Now, will the, will the HBO series, and it would be malpractice on our part to not ask you your thoughts on a, a real tragedy. I mean, there were so many tragedies in We Own This City. As I said, I kept telling people, you'll read it in a day and your day will be shot because you won't be able to put it down. I mean, I just kept zoom, 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 zoom through the book. Um, the, the, I guess the last tragedy in the book, beyond Wayne Jenkins and all that and you know, luckily, I, I used to say, uh, cross my, you know, bless myself and say novenas every time I'd get to a part about Baltimore County. And thank goodness, every time it got to Baltimore County, our county police officers did the right thing. I'm going, oh, thank goodness. You know, they, if there's anybody that comes out, uh, you know, on the right side of this, it's the Baltimore County police. I was so grateful. But right. we and, end up and with, oddly enough, the Harford County Sheriff's Department police. and the Harford County Sheriff. Yeah, <laughs> abs absolutely. So we end up with this tragedy that is Sean Souter. Does does the series end and, and cover the Sean Souter tragedy as it makes it to HBO? Does that make it to it the does. screen, Bill? It does make it. In fact, the Sean Souter character is we see him through throughout the series. What what is your you've written about it, you've read about it. Um boy, we Nestor and I have gotten so many uh different pieces about Suter. Where do you land now as someone who studied it and written about it, as to what happened to Sean Suter? Hmm. <laughs> like what happened in the large sense or just in the in the quite down to the question of whether he killed himself or whether both, he was killed. both both large sense and then whether he killed himself um i i believe he he did kill himself that's what i believe um and you know i think it's it it really is a, a tragedy a horrible <laughs> tragedy um and i don't know the extent that he was really ever involved in certainly not the antics of, of what we've come to know as the GTTF uh, episode and policing. Um, but, you know, I think he, he may have witnessed things that he was duty bound to report and didn't. And I think that just aid at him eventually. That, that's what I think. Well, but Bill, as a as as someone who dug in and was known as a tough reporter, go back to Nestor's question because it's one that we've been unable to answer. And I've had FOP on, I've had 
the police chief was on. We, I've never gotten what I find to be a satisfactory answer to Nestor's question, which is how the hell did all of this happen? Yet we're supposed to believe that the higher ups didn't know what was going on with a wink, wink, nod, nod. What? Put your reporter hat back on. What what are we supposed to believe about who knew what about the gun trace task force? Hmm. I mean, is your question, do I think that they they knew that they were out there robbing drug dealers and, and you know sticking up people and, yeah. and and willing willing to look the other way because Jenkins and his guys were racking up huge arrest number yes that is the question well i don't i don't i don't know that i personally believe that uh the hierarchy of the baltimore city police department like looked the other way because and and knew what they were doing i i don't believe that um and maybe i'm being naive that's reassuring to me but um you they know, were just I bringing think, guns in, right? They, they were. were just, they were they bringing were, guns were, in. They were exactly why they, they're the kind of cop we want to have. They're they're getting guns off the street, right? Exactly, and dope off the street, and you know, blah 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 blah. And the uh, bad guys. Bill, they Bill, were bad what guys. motivated? And you've you've been very generous. We won't keep you much longer. What when you look at it now, you and Simon and Justin? What motivated Wayne? Je you you love complex characters. It's what drew you to show me a hero. You had them in spades in the wire. Who is Wayne Jenkins? T tell folks that what, what makes a Wayne Jenkins? Wow. <laughs> do, you, do you have any easy questions? Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, the guy grew up in, you know, on the East side. In Essex, um, he was an Essex guy, right? EVT guy, um, right? Baltimore yeah. County. And, uh, I think he, I think he was uh, an HVAC guy at some point. And then, you know, he joins the Marines and he, I, I, I don't know what makes that, you know, I mean. Power makes that right. Well, power, power and, makes, yeah. Greed, yeah. power and greed. greed. Um, I mean, it was so much money. I mean, I mean, I'm, I can imagine, I can't wait to see, the, I, I can imagine these scenes where they're, out in the back in a garage giving bags of money to i mean we're talking big big dollars right well, by the way i want to promote this just so we get it square it premieres april 25th on hbo am i saying that correct bill that's what i understand yeah yeah, yeah. i'm just i'm just reading off the web here and everybody can go watch it if you have hbo and obviously we're gonna have justin fenton on as well who wrote the book so I, I just don't want people to be lost in what we're talking about that this is a real thing that's a couple of weeks away from from it's it's done right it's in the it's it's six series six episodes correct six episodes and uh it's in i think they're the fine the final throws the post-production up in new york so does actor you know. bill zorsey did he get a call back on this one? No, he didn't. He 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 uh he's been working on other things. So he's been <laughs> been very good. Ne what's next for Bill Zorsey as we wrap it up? What's next on your um, to-do list? Well, I've I've focused on <laughs> my contractual obligation to uh uh to finish writing a, a book about uh with with David uh Simon, my my occasional partner. Um Give him my love. Sort of, yeah. On, on, as soon as I, as soon as I hear from him again, I, I will. <laughs> so, um, about the rise of the drug culture in Baltimore. So, uh, it's sort of a historical, not nonfiction narrative of, uh, you know, going back to 1950 and coming forward. So, um, Can't wait. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll have you yeah. back on as that project evolves. Regardless of what you think or what you say, terrific guest. Bill Zorsey, longtime Baltimore son, uh, HBO fan. Started slow. He didn't trust me. He's a reporter. And then, you know, then I want him <laughs> over. So, Bill, I'll, I'll say this with Simon because I just want to, like, he's never going to do the show. He's got an open invite. Dave, if you're out there, we're looking for you. Come have a crab cake. Sit next to me. But I, I have this book that I wait, acquired wait. in the 90s. What? How, Simon how come I don't get a, a, an offer for a crab cake? Oh, no, you do. That's a standing offer. There when do you, you want go, to come out? Maybe at Mama's on the half shell next Friday. I'll see you there. I, I'm doing the crab cake tour. I, I absolutely now 
I've got you on film, so now you have to come out. But with Simon, he's so beautifully profane on social media. Um, and I have this book of maledicta that is all of these insults over the, the ages in all of these languages translated. And I told him when I saw him, the only thing I think about is like all the stuff he's done, wire, all these wireless stuff. All I think about is you're the most profane mf -er I've ever met. And I have a book <laughs> to give to you that's going to make you even more profane because he works in he works in it like an art form. I mean, it really, he, he's, he's an incredible follow, a very unique follow on social media. You must admit. I don't, I don't, I don't have anything to do with social media. <laughs> ah, you miss all the humor. Bill's, Bill's, just a, Bill's the writer. That's why Simon's got a hell of a sense of humor. Let me tell you he's that. He's still too. offended. He's still offended that you haven't read Hemingway. I mean, yeah. what the hell? I mean, I don't know what to say. Here's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to make a promise to you from your art. I am absolutely going to watch this series um, because I am fascinated. Which, which one? You haven't seen any of them yet. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't read Hemingway. You Thank you, Bill. How, do you, how, how, how is it that you keep your didn't write Hemingway. Um, we own this city. I, I, I'm gonna, this is a parting shot for you. And this is serious business. Why do I need to watch it? And in your way of putting this together, this is a true story that you're trying to bring to life with true facts, right? So the, the you, you talked about writing a, a, a writing for television being different. What are we going to see in these six episodes that maybe mirror the book or in some way change how much Don loved the book? Well, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I assume it'll give you some sort of insight into, you know, while it's dramatized, it's based on fact and, uh, you know, how policing exists in the city of Baltimore or, or did at least through Freddie Gray and, you know, until 2017, March 1st, I think it was, they busted the, these guys. Um, and, then, and then where we are today is a whole other thing. But, um, uh, you know, I think it gives you an idea of how we got to where we are really. So, you know, I think anybody who cares about what uh, is happening in the city and wants some sort of insight and understanding as to how we got here, I think it's valuable in that regard. I promise, you. last question. Real quick, Bill, because Nestor got me thinking about this when he just asked, what's in, when you write for the screenplay, do, do you as a writer... And Nestor's a right. Do you have to become Wayne Jenkins at moment? Do you have to then become Jay Landsman? Do you have to become, do you have to think like each character? How does the process work? <laughs> That's sort of a big question, but yeah. It's next episode. I, I, I think you do. Yeah, I'll come back. How about if I come <laughs> back tomorrow? But, but no, I, I mean, I remember talking to this guy who had been a councilman in Yonkers and I was trying, he, he was like, why, why do you, you know, it's all in the record. I don't know what, what do you need from me? Why, why do you want to talk to me? I was like, because I, I don't have, I don't have the voices in my head. There you and, go. Then I th and then I thought to myself, this guy thinks, <laughs> this guy will never goddamn, excuse me, this guy will never talk to me now because he thinks I have voices in my head. <laughs> you know? But, but he did. And he was, you know, he was very helpful actually, but th that's exactly right. And uh, and the other thing that, that that I guess is is different about, I mean, really di markedly different is, you know, the show show don't tell uh, of of screenwriting or, or television writing, where my whole life had been spent telling. That was that was that's that's the newspaper's job to tell you what happened. Here's what happened, not to show you what happened and let you think about it, you know, or you know, guide you through, you know, some sort of, sort of evolution and, you know, um, so, you know, when I first, my first screen, you know, the, my first attempt at screenwriting, I would write these long sections of dialogue because I, I felt I had to explain what, what's going on, you know, because that's what I, that's what we do. That's what we, we do ideally in, you know, in reporting the news. So, you know, on a piece of paper, you never want to see a block of copy like that on, in a screen, you know, of, of dialogue, you know, because people don't talk like that, especially except, except here, for, except Nestor here. Yeah, when I'm on the radio, show. right, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I that knew is, you were going to say that. that. I knew that. 
Bill, we really Nestor. appreciate you having on, having you on, and, and I definitely want to get a crab cake. And if uh, if you it must be Fadley's, come on down to Lexington Market, tell some stories or whatnot, or we'll get you over to Costas or uh, Pappas or Conrad's, one of the places we're going to be going the next couple months. But really appreciate the time, and I, I'd love to have you back. I'd love to have David on too, but only as a willing guest. Not I'm not. It's, we're not going to do root canal with Dave, but um, <laughs> to promote to promote the series seriously. <laughs> there, there, it's like you know a root canal or a proctology exam. You know, it's one, <laughs> one or the other. I the don't thing know. with Dave is, and here's the issue because. I do have an FCC license and I, and I do drop two of the seven Carlin words from time to time when I'm really angry, but not the other five. I have to let Dave work blue. You know what I mean? Like if Dave's going to come on the show, if he worked blue, maybe then we could, you know, have him on the program. But I really do want to promote it's like show business talk, like who work blue. What is that? You mean you, you know. we'll have David? We'll have David just for a podcast episode that we won't put on the radio. Then you'll be good to go. When I want to be abused by my guest for a crab cake, I'm going to have Bill Zorzi come by. So. You should call me because I, I, I've you. been holding back, Nestor. I just wanted to let you know. And I do remember you. I do remember you from the newsroom, as I recall. Oh, what did I do? You you were like the agate Kirk clerk in sports. I was. I right. was. So I was a scoreboard guy. That's that's about as low as you can be in the newsroom. <laughs> I was 17. I know. No, no. I, I, I think that's where Raphael started doing the same thing. I had the same job Larry Short had. It was great. I didn't pick up his accent, but I love Larry. You have I, don't to be- think, I don't think he did have the same job as Larry Short. <laughs> we were editorial assistants, according to the Baltimore Washington Newspaper Guild. So that's true. Okay. <laughs> Bill Zorzi, careful. man, we appreciate you. Don, get, get us out of here. I'm going to say, be careful. Raphael and I will sing the uh, Mount St. Joe fight song. Tremendous, legendary Bill Zorsey, uh, <laughs> HBO, coming up April 25th. We own this city. You won't want to miss it. Bill, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, and Thank if you you're both. into We Own This City, we're also going to have Justin Fenton on a little later. I'm going to talk about journalism and newspapers and banners and suns and all that good stuff. Maryland Crab Cake Tour comes to Mama's on a Half Shell in uh, Nacho Mama's down in Canton. We'll begin that on March 4th. Every Friday, we're going to have a Crab Cake Tour and doing something really special in the month of May. I'll be telling you more about. Big appreciation to our friends at the Maryland Lottery for letting us play with that. I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking. Baltimore, positive.